So in this lesson, we're going to talk about how you should be practicing. And I, I felt this was very important for lesson 100 because the last 100 lessons have been, here's what to practice. Go practice this stuff. Here's what you need to be practicing. But now at lesson 100, I want to kind of shed light on, well, how should you be practicing it? Now you know what to practice, so over 30 hours of content and growing every week. you got a lot to keep you busy, but how should you practice it? So I want to talk about my personal approach to practicing and just give you some quick tips on that that really may you know, make a big result and a big change in the way you practice and progress as a musician and as a bass player. So the biggest thing I want to point out is just some, some sort of mottos and just things I go by when I practice. I want to talk about the difficulty sandwich. Yes, that's called a difficulty sandwich. And that's something I've embraced for a, the better part of my time playing bass. And it's sort of a, a, the mental part of practicing. And a lot of people look at practicing like this purely physical um, gauge of progress. Am I getting faster? Am I getting cleaner? Can I play longer? Is my endurance better? Do I have more stamina? Does my tone sound better? Can I do this technique? you know, faster than I could yesterday. It's all, everybody thinks about the physical side, but a lot of people don't realize that the whole act of getting in and practicing and how you feel about it and how you view your progress and the whole like emotional, mental side of practicing is something that is completely overlooked because you're so, you know, in the blinders about, can I play it faster and better and do this technique I couldn't do yesterday? But there's the whole other side of it of, of you know, self-confidence and how you feel about your playing. So I want to talk about the difficulty sandwich, which is basically a way to divide up your practicing in a given routine. So how often should you be practicing? Let's talk about that first. And how much should you practice? Well, I understand that bass isn't everyone's full-time job. And a lot of people do this for fun. You know, a lot of people do it maybe semi-professionally or maybe professionally, or it's just a complete for fun thing when I have time. And I understand there's those varying degrees of musicianship among you guys. So I would you know, obviously suggest practicing every day, okay? Because you know, when you don't practice for a long time, it's not the music theory you lose. It's not the knowledge of the fretboard. It's not you forget how to play the song, really. It's that you're just rusty from a physical standpoint. And I've talked about this in other lessons. I talked about this in lesson number one. Playing bass is a physical act. You need to keep the muscles conditioned. It's just like an athletic sport with smaller muscle groups. And a lot of these muscle groups you don't really use in any other thing in life as much as you do playing bass. Things like your ring and pinky fingers and that type of stuff. And those are kind of exclusive moments those fingers and smaller muscle groups get to be used. So, you know, I talked about this in lesson, I hate when I try to think about the numbers of the lessons because I usually get them wrong now with so many, but I think it's lesson 81. Holiday chop maintenance. You can scratch off the word holiday and just call that chop maintenance. And that's a great thing to be doing just to keep your chops in shape. Okay, so that's a one to check out, and we'll talk about that too. But you need to be playing every day. If you can pick up your bass for 10 minutes with no amp plugged in, just play something. Just keep those muscles active, because that's the hardest thing to regain. You're not going to forget your C Phrygian scale. You're not going to forget what the seventh of an A minor chord is in an A minor seven chord, but you're going to lose the chops. That's what you don't want to lose. That's where the regression happens. So how much should you be practicing in a given day? Let's say you can do it every day. I would recommend a minimum. Of 30 minutes a day. And I know a lot of people don't have that kind of time. If you do have the amount of time, I would recommend an hour a day. I really would. To really just get some progress, some chop maintenance, and to feel good about your playing and just have a solid practice session. I would recommend an hour. If you can't do that, try 30 minutes. And if you can't do that, at least get 10 minutes of just muscle, keeping it fresh, keeping the muscles fresh and the chops fresh. So, now that that's out of the way, we've talked about how much to practice. How should you divide up your practice? That's the hot topic. That's something I get asked all the time. I call it the difficulty sandwich. I'm going to explain what this is called and why this is so important to me. If I think back through my whole bass playing career and times I felt very inspired, I felt very motivated, or times when I felt like I wasn't good or I felt like I wasn't getting much progress or I felt like I was in a rut or I've stagnated, it was always correlated to how my last practice session went. And the times I felt really good, not like good, like I'm a good player, but I just felt good about my playing. Any particular time was I put my bass down and I felt good about what I just played. That's about the last impression. Whatever you play, is whatever the last thing you play is, and you put your instrument down, when you let go, the last thing you played is, gonna ha is how you're going to view your practice session. 
Last impressions are important. We talk about first impressions a lot in the world, but last impressions are something I find more important when it comes to practicing. So the difficulty sandwich is taking two easy things and sandwiching, sandwiching them, sandwiching them, that's tough to say, with a hard topic in the middle. So let's say I had 30 minutes to practice on a given day. I want to spend 10 minutes doing something easy, 10 minutes doing something hard, and the last 10 minutes doing something easy. You want to end with something you're very good at. So the way I normally do it is I take a long-term goal and a short-term goal. That's how I always do it. You always want to have two goals. You want to have a long-term goal, something you can say, well, six months from now, I want to be able to do this. Then you want to say, one month from now, or maybe even two weeks from now, I want to be able to do this. You should always have a short-term goal and a long-term goal. They don't have to be related, but it's good to have two different types of perspectives and two different types of missions when practicing. And it kind of breaks things up a bit. If you feel like your long-term goal is just not coming along, work on another short-term goal. If you feel like you're just killing your short-term goals, focus more on that long-term goal. And they just kind of feed off of each other, and that's good progress. It's like multitasking over a period of time. So I would make your short-term goal the first easy thing you play. And when I say short-term goal, I mean tightening something up. You just learned how to do tapping, but some strings are ringing out. Now I need to learn how to mute. Something you can just do in a matter of a week or two. Something real easy. It may be hard, but when I say easy, I'm thinking of it's, it's achievable in the near future. Just tightening something up or a, a, a run in a fast part of a song that is, just needs a little bit of tightening up. It's a little rough around the edges and you just need to make it clean. Short-term goals that you know you need to fix. Long-term goals, the hard stuff. I want to learn the double thump technique. When I first learned that technique, that was a long-term goal. It took easily six to eight months to really get down. And when I first started doing that technique, I remember looking down and just kind of going like... <laughs> And it just was awful and I was just like man I got so discouraged with that technique and I would spend hours a day on that just going <coughs> just getting all hung up and then I got discouraged and I would put the bass down and when it came time to play it the next day the first thing that comes to mind is well how did yesterday's practice session go and I thought I didn't get any headway on that long-term goal ah screw it I'm not gonna get to it so the last thing I played if I leave on a negative note you're gonna leave yourself feeling very discouraged so you should never end your practice session with something you can't do or something you want to do. You should never end your practice session with something that's discouraging or frustrating. Because then the next day you'll just be like, whatever, I don't feel like doing it. And then you lost a day of practice. And maybe that turns into weeks, months, years. I've had students say, I'm picking up the bass for the first time in 10 years because I just got so discouraged with it 10 years ago. And I found that their progress was halted less by the physical aspect of playing bass and it was more about the mentality. I couldn't get it down. I could never learn this song. I just could never do it. Well, you didn't set enough short-term goals and be able to achieve them and feel good about your playing. You have to feel good about your playing. I know there's that whole self-betterment, never be satisfied thing, but you don't want to just bog yourself down so much with frustration that you don't even have fun doing this anymore. That is the complete wrong way to go about it. So back on topic, the difficulty sandwich. Take your practice time, if it's 30 minutes, divide into three parts. Easy, hard, easy. Now the last part, the easy part, the second easy part, you want to end with something very easy. I don't mean practice whole notes for 10 minutes. I mean play a song that you can play very well. Think about what can I do very well? And part of having to ask yourself that, that question is kind of a self-confidence boost. It boosts your self-image as a musician. If I, thought, if I hold my bass right now and said, what do I do very well on bass? I could think of a couple of things, and that's what I would end, with my, end my practice session with. Because after 10 minutes of playing something you're very good at, and you know and you're comfortable with, and it just feels good in your hands, when you put your bass down, you leave feeling refreshed. That's the last thing you remember. You feel good about your playing, so when it comes time to tomorrow, it almost tricks yourself into thinking you got something done. Even if you didn't really get much progress on your short-term goal, your long-term goal was really frustrating. You end with 10 minutes of something you're really good at and you feel like you've gotten something done. You feel good about your playing. And again, the times I've noticed the most progress in my playing was when I kind of had this self-confidence of like, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing all right. And it's all about ending on an easy note, ending on a good note. So to sum that up, take your practice a lot of time for the day. Let's say it's an hour, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. 
And you might be thinking, well, shouldn't I get, shouldn't I make the long-term goal have more time because it's a long-term goal? No, you should make them equal because you don't want to spend too much time being discouraged and too much time working out something that's unattainable right now because then you just get discouraged quicker. If you make just a little bit of progress, that's fine. You just want to do that every day. There's no rush to learn something ever. You want to pace yourself. Spend more time on the stuff you do know. That makes you feel better, makes you want to practice more. That's my philosophy and that's what I've always gone by and it's worked great for me. So start with a short-term goal, easy, something you can achieve pretty quickly in a couple weeks, maybe a month. Next, you know, third of the practice session, something hard, something unattainable, a technique you've never tried before, sight reading, music theory, anything like that, learning the notes on the fretboard, things that take a long time. And then the last third of your session, end with something you're very good at. Always start that phase of your practice session with, what's a song I know really well? What's a song I can play really well? And I like to make it just playing along to songs. I do it all the time. I pull up my iTunes and just, oh yeah, that, that one's fun. Click that one and play along. Do that maybe two or three times, and there's the last third of my hour-long practice session. Ends on a good note. There's nothing more fun than playing along to actual music. It's, you know, it's not up for debate. That's a very fun thing to do for musicians. So that's how I would structure, structure my practice session. That's what works for me. <clears throat> I encourage you to try it to your own practice and see how it just psychologically makes you feel better about your practice time and makes you just feel better about yourself as a musician. I know a lot of players struggle with this type of thing, so that's my answer to that. Let's end very quickly with talking about how to warm up. You should never make your warm up really a part of your allotted practice session. Think about your practice time like a performance. If you know you're gigging and you're going to be playing an hour, you don't warm up for the first five minutes of your hour set because then you really have 55 minutes to play. You would think about, I have an hour set to play, let me warm up before I play my hour long gig. So you should really make exclusivity between those two. Now, the warm up part is something a lot of people overthink and I'm going to explain why you should never overthink that. <clears throat> Warming up your body doesn't know any different to different things, ever. And I always make the analogy to somebody who runs marathons or runs track and field. Wondering, well, what scale should I play to warm up? Should I be doing string skipping? Should I uh, be doing tapping? Should I be doing pentatonics? You know, should I be doing fast stuff up, up high on the neck? Should I be doing some low stuff? I get asked that stuff a lot, just like really particular things about warming up. And I equate that to a runner going, well, I need to get warmed up to run, uh, do my daily run. Should I run north or should I run south or should I start with my right foot? Should I maybe start with my left foot? What color socks should I wear? What color shirt should I wear? How much water should I drink? Little things that just don't matter. When you start running, your body's going to respond like it always does. So my answer to that is when you warm up, just play. Just play something. And I apply that same thing to the sort of maintenance practice. You know, if you get 10 minutes a day and that's all you have to practice and you're just doing it to keep your chops fresh, just play anything. Just play. Your muscles need to be active and that's what you're doing to keep them either maintained or just to warm up. Just play something. And you can make that kind of an easy thing too. Just play some scales. It doesn't have to be the coolest bass line ever written. Just play something to get them moving. Now, if you want to get specific on what to play there, I will say this. Do things that require big movements. So let me pull the bass back out again. And the reason is, is because you want to kind of try to get every combination your hands and fingers and wrists and arms might make together when you play. You want to kind of get them in that mode before you practice. So this would not be a good example. You wouldn't want to warm up like this. This is not doing any movement. That's not more movement. That's that's no more movement than you would do texting on your phone, really. So you're not really warming up the fretting hand. This might be getting some speed, but you want to do things that have big movements. Do some slides, you know, and do some string skipping. Stuff like this. Stuff 
like that where you're really getting your whole, the whole equation at work. Okay, and it doesn't have to be anything particular. I warm up like this all the time. Play things that are just not characteristic of what I'm about to play or practice. And just get both hands moving. Do some string skipping. That kind of gets that one moving big. Do some slap bass. gets the arm and the wrist moving there and it, the whole point is to get the muscles woken up and activated okay and then save the really nitpicky stuff for your practice your short-term goals your long-term goals and maybe a song you like playing for the last third of your session that's my personal philosophy on practice how you should be practicing how much how you should divide up your time how to warm up and everything in between that is a complete a to z way i think about it and that's what i do on a daily basis